Hello and welcome to The Penguin Podcast, the place where leading authors reveal how they unlock their creative process. I'm Katie Brand and today I'm joined by an author and journalist whose first book, How to Eat, was published 20 years ago and changed the landscape of food writing. She's now had 11 best-selling books and a number of successful TV programmes which have elevated her to goddess status with food lovers worldwide. It is, of course, Nigella Lawson. Nigella, welcome. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. <laughs> did you uh, did you like that little pricey of um, your career? Uh, well, <laughs> you know, blushing slightly and also slightly panicked about the idea that I have in any way some creative discipline that I can explain. <laughs> Uh, don't don't go for the word discipline. No, Let's just go yes. for process. Process. Well, process. Yes, process is a forgiving word. Environment. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll call it the creative confusion. environment. Yeah, confusion okay. for me is my creative environment. Well, that's good too. It obviously mm. works. <laughs> so, as is traditional on this podcast, we ask authors to bring along a handful of objects that inspire them. And Nigella has obliged with a photograph of a special table, a tea caddy, and a well thumbed cookbook. And we'll explore those objects in a moment. But before we do, How to Eat has just been released as an audiobook. Why hasn't it been released as an audiobook before? And how was it presented to you to, to make your cookbook, which seems sort of counterintuitive that people would listen to it? You know, the thing is, a lot of How to Eat is words. I mean, I know the recipe is words, but it's it's the recipes. A lot of the recipes are uh, said as suggestions. It didn't start off as a recipe book. I I was just writing about food. And then as I wrote more, I started writing recipes. I suddenly found there were recipes written in a recipe format. It, it, It astonished me. I'm not a food writer. I'm not a cookery person. I'm not a chef. I'm not professional in any way. But I enjoyed talking about food and I still enjoy talking about food. Therefore, you know, reading it out loud was a challenge. When you were reading it out loud like that, mm. did you rediscover your book for yourself? Because as you say, the recipes are embedded in the prose. I discovered certain things and I reminded myself of certain things. I felt embarrassed about some things. Sometimes <laughs> I just thought, oh, God, you pretentious idiot. <laughs> I don't know. Or I thought, well, I don't know. I think now I like, you know, what I've said I don't do, I would do now, but you can't change because of that. It's so interesting the way this, the landscape's changed in terms of how people want to eat and then heading mm. into the future because although there's plenty of stuff about vegetarianism and all of that kind of side of things, it's it's quite tentative because it's yeah. early days for that kind of thing, whereas now it's yes, completely right. mainstream. Yes, if you cook in order to feed other people, obviously the way other people eat... Is, that's going to inform the recipes you write. And if you're a person who loves cooking, then it's really interesting to cook in a slightly different way. Mm. You know, there's a sort of reactionary way of moaning on about veganism and how boring it is. Well, actually, I think if you like cooking, it's really creatively interesting. But I think also what comes across in your writing and what people really respond to, that you not only like food and like cooking, but I think you like people and you want to feed people and, mm. and therefore if you have someone who eats differently to you at your table that you want to feed yes. them what they would enjoy no eating. quite I've never I mean I think I wrote about this in How to Eat which is if I have someone who in those days we just thought vegetarian I don't think we kind of thought out vegan if you had someone vegetarian it would never occur to me to do a separate dish for them you just would have everyone eating that mm. and I still do that and Because part of the point about eating around a table is that you're sharing an experience. Mm. So I think to try and mark people out as different in some way is so antithetical to the whole process. Mm. Food writing is so much about an enjoyment of language as well, because I do think in some way... You know, words have a taste and the rhythm of a sentence is important. And I think for a lot of people who are anxious about cooking, I think they need to be gradually taken into the kitchen. So I don't think it's suddenly barking orders saying this is an instruction. It's explaining a recipe in the context of a life and so that the person reading it can see where that might fit in with her or his life. Human beings have a need 
for food and drink and connection and narrative. And in a way, all these things can exist very happily in a, in a cookery book or cookbook as we call it now. Yeah, I agree. So let's go to your first object. It is a picture of your table. It is. It's not the best picture in the world because I took it. But it, in fact, I just took it on Saturday. What I feel is, in terms of inspiration, that... It has to be about feeding people and about eating. In restaurants, that's something I always think of as sort of concept cuisine, when people have a brilliant idea and then they try and turn it into something you're going to eat. That doesn't appeal to me. You don't like to cook with a pipette. <laughs> no, but every now and then I suddenly do like a certain object mm -hmm. and I, things in my cooking become used. I got quite into a meat probe fairly recently, but then uh, very came that? out of it. Well, I'll tell you what it is, is that Americans always like to know what temperature meat is cooked at. That's how they do it. They don't say, well done, they say the internal temperature has to be. Do you know, in the end, I use it instead for doing little indentations on biscuits because I like, <laughs> it's got a nice little prongy thing on the edge. Because, I mean, really, I don't trust it. So, so this is my this table. And so it's can this, I have a look? Because yes. it, this, you took this yourself of your table on Saturday. Because I had people over on Saturday. And I have to say, this will debunk any, any suspicion that anyone has that you don't cook delicious food just as normal at home and serve it in this beautiful way because this table is covered with dishes of unbelievably nice looking food. But you see, it was quite interesting. So that's my zinc table, which I'm very fond of. Mm -hmm. And, you, you know, the fact is it's kind of cluttered table. And what I've always found is that to make things more relaxing, it's easy if you don't do a, a lot of getting up and down at dinner. So I don't do first courses. I have something like I made a salsa to have over drinks. But I do not want to sit down. I hate formality anyway. I don't want to sit down and then everyone has a starter and then you have to clear the plates. In restaurants they have lots of plates and lots of cutlery so you don't necessarily then want to be washing up things. It's it's wrong so I just put everything on the table at the same time and actually a lot of the stuff could be cooked at different times. You're not doing everything at the last minute and so for me that's the easiest way to feed people. I think that the more relaxed you are the better time everyone has. Yeah. And I think that's it. That's the generosity mm. of spirit that you have in wanting mm. to feed people. Well, it's selfish and too. With but people. it's selfish too because I just feel I will get stressy yeah. if I'm talking to people. I live in one open space, and they're talking to me, and I'm thinking I'm cooking something that needs such precise attention. And I did a spatchcock chicken that I had uh, marinated in buttermilk because the other day I went completely mad and decided to make my own butter, so I had some buttermilk left over. <laughs> Um, and delicious though. And um, I'm a greedy person, but if, and I love eating, but if the food is the best thing about an evening with friends, it's not a good evening. And you talk in the book about how there's no need to show off or mm. try and impress your friends. And that's definitely when I first started trying to cook for my friends in my early 20s. Mm. That was something, the mistake I made over and over yes. again, one particularly disastrous set of fish cakes that just kind of became a sort of lake of mush. And after that, I did just think, this is ridiculous. I've spent all this time trying to impress my friends and I've actually ended up making something horrible. The evening has to be that the next day you think, didn't we have a laugh? Mm. And I want to go and see that play. And oh, it was so good to talk to him about all those things he's been going through. I'm glad he did that. Or And then wasn't, you know, this? I'm going to get that book. And it, so you're exchanging ideas, people talking about their life, all those things. And yes, the food is there to facilitate it. But if all you can say is, uh, you know, the apricot cake was exceptional. And that's the best thing about the evening. What a dismal failure. Yeah, I agree. So this table here, how old is this? Did you write How to Eat Anywhere Near no, This? No, it's not old. I'm not, I, am, I don't have anything uh, very old. And I'm not an... I don't think I ascribe great importance to things in that way. I got these tables when I moved into my house where I am now, which is probably about four years ago. And I work in the room, that room too. So what I, I wanted to have tables that were quite narrow because I like conversation to go all the way round. I don't like people to be far apart from one another. So they're fairly narrow. So it's quite hard getting a lot of food on. And I have two that are identical so that I work on one and eat on the other, like for a big thing, for a special birthday or Christmas, I can put the two together. I, I think a table is so important. I think it's, it's what makes a home feel like home. I think one of the things that most struck everyone about how to eat when it first came out was that you wrote unashamedly about the pleasure of eating. It wasn't mm. just a kind of sterile set of recipes. Mm. It, it's, it's more than a reference book. Did it grow as you grew in confidence as you wrote it? I felt very strongly that... 
reducing food to what it is technically is a mistake and it isn't how we experience food. But I, I do think as well, as I suppose as a woman, I feel that women are so often made to feel that food is their enemy, our enemy, and that we feel bad about uh, what we eat or our bodies and that somehow it's unseemly to take pleasure in food and I reject that I reject that so strongly and I think it's so pernicious I don't think I set out with a manifesto but it's engraved in my every cell so it couldn't help but come out when I wrote one of the things I feel about the way you write about food it's quite profound it's not just about eating it's not it seems to be even more than the pleasure of eating it's like mm. when the world's chaotic or challenging or whatever that we can restore order somehow i think so i mean i think that in order to be able to cook well you have to allow a certain amount of chaos you have to let things unfold as they will but at the same time you need a framework and i find you can learn that in cooking and it maybe teaches you um, in the rest of life, that not everything can be controlled and often the mistakes you make lead to better things. So many of us just live inside our heads with all the chaos, noise and tension uh, that implies. So for me, it's actually quite good. As someone who was always brought up feeling I was clumsy, I'm hopeless, cack-handed, all those things, I feel it's quite important be someone who cooks like that. So when I'm on television, for example, and often I'm castigated with this, but it's sort of absurd, you know, when I have no knife skills, you know, it is actually appalling to watch. <laughs> um, and yet you don't need knife skills to cook. You see, you don't need techniques. So I think that it's really about finding a way of, of making things fit in with life rather than be yet another challenge. I don't go along with this theory that we all need a challenge Getting up is enough of a challenge often, isn't it? For a lot of people, you know, getting through the day. You don't need to make things more complicated. So I think you have to look to make things simpler. And I also think you don't make a fetish out of it because there are some days when, you know, the finest thing you can eat is some toast and butter. So I think in a way, if you can remove the ego a bit and just enjoy it for what it is, it doesn't matter whether you're using, you know, frozen peas or not, which... Nigel Sater calls me the queen of the frozen pea and it's an accolade I'm very proud of. Um, but it doesn't matter also if you want plastic white bread in your sandwiches. It's all this this notion that this makes you a better person, this makes you a worse person. And, you know, cooking is not a moral good. You know, I always feel like I don't make my clothes. I buy them because I can't sew. So, and what's the difference? Mm. And I, I've always thought achievable goals is the path yeah. to happiness. And yes. you can say, oh, I want to be the best writer in the world. Well, what does that mean? No, and even if you do write the greatest thing, there's someone will just say, well, what are you going to do next? Whereas I, I always think some people like washing up because there's a beginning, a middle and an end. I like washing up, but I hate putting away. Oh, yeah, I hate unlo unloading the dishwasher is one of my worst jobs. I like putting it it's all taking in, though. Things out of the taking things out of the draining board is what I really can't yeah. bear. I, I, get, you know, I have a sort of huge pyramid of things. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, when I said cooking is, you know, is... Is not a it's not a moral entity I suppose I don't mean that necessarily I think cooking doesn't make you a morally superior person I think is what I mean more or rather the contro um, controlling your intake mm. doesn't necessarily mean oh well, absolutely your, no. and I think one of your I mean your diet it's not a diet section let's call well, it the, the low fat section for people who might want to shed a few pounds uh, is probably one of the most relaxed I've ever read and not many people have a whole section on puddings or encouraging people just to <laughs> eat puddings but do you know what though it's really odd because that's the one chapter I would have taken out. Really? Yes. One, because I don't believe in low fat now. Even though I don't believe in that, I still eat a lot of the food in there because the food is cooked to taste good in itself. Even in the low fat chapter, I said, do not ever cook a low fat version of what should be high fat. For me, the notion that if you wanted to lose weight, and I did at that stage because I put on you know, more weight than any human being could believe after I had my first child. <laughs> um, and <laughs> and so I did. After a year, I thought, oh, I'll do something about it. But I love food, so I didn't want to reduce the time spent thinking about food or cooking it. And I didn't want to deprive myself. One of the unusual things, I think, about the book at the time, and probably still, is a whole chapter on cooking for just yourself, mm. or many, many recipes. Yeah. Did you do that very deliberately at the time because you no, felt there no. was a gap? No, 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 not at all. It was my life, you know, because my late husband, John, had oral cancer and couldn't eat. It was my way of holding on to food and 
making it an important ritual in my life. Now, obviously, often I, you know, I did, as I say, have a piece of toast or so, but it it felt important to me. So, so in a way, all these recipes just come out of my life and what they were. I remember my mother once going to some friend of hers for lunch and she came back and she was completely astonished. She said, oh, you know, she did all this, she did all this cooking and she did all that and it was just us. You know, brought up to that, you only did it for men. That's what my mother would have thought. Why would you be doing all that? Why would you do something to give something to yourself? And I feel that it's a terrible way to go through life. And I love cooking for myself. I adore it because I also don't have to... I'm completely free. I'm not weighing or measuring, which is just heaven. And also, I don't care if it goes wrong. That's why I always say to people, if you're frightened of cooking, cook for yourself, because it doesn't matter if it goes wrong. It's only you who's eating it, and you will work out what needs to be different. But also, I can just please myself. And sometimes I think I have slightly eccentric tastes. I don't need to worry about, I mean, not that I worry enormously about other people, because I can only cook what I like. But nevertheless, I just can put anything in and I'm, I hate waste. So I'm always putting strange leftovers together in a way that you couldn't really, you couldn't quite sell it to everyone else. And also there's probably only enough for one meal, but I enjoy that. Mm. You had to get used to the idea of weighing and measuring when mm. you started to write down recipes. Yes. And one of the recipes was for hollandaise sauce, where you realised yeah. you actually, you had to sit down and really think because it was muscle memory. It was very hard for me, but I also think to some extent... Those of us who write recipes have a very difficult relationship with precision because we want to be precise in order to help people, but sometimes being too precise doesn't give anyone the freedom to see how it might go differently. So, yes, you can say however much butter you need in your hollandaise, but actually you could probably do a bit less or a bit more and it wouldn't really matter. I must have cooked a white sauce or, you know, what people more grandly call a bechamel, but we called a white sauce at home so many times to get the measurements right and still at home now I would never measure the flour or the butter or the milk because I can only do it by feel Mm. but I do think it's very helpful to follow other people's recipes because you get an idea of how a recipe is helpful when it's written or not I get so obsessive about you know what's right and how to do it and how to make it simpler and not being a trained chef is helpful because I panic often when I cook and I think oh no no this is going all runny and it's meant to be thick and then it gets thicker later whereas if I were more skilled it would never occur to me to worry so I can say to other people don't worry about this. Definitely and I think that sense comes across you have a friend in the kitchen Mm. in you. Let's move on to your next object yes. now, uh, a tea caddy that you've brought <laughs> yes. uh, from home. This is your very it tea is. caddy. I bought it in Paris in 1990, I remember. Um, and it's sort of aluminium, sort of squiggly thing. It does keep... I have three. I have one for tea, one for sugar, one for instant coffee. Instant, instant coffee. coffee? Yes. Actually, I'm not a coffee drinker, but I do keep no. instant coffee there. <laughs> okay. I use it a lot in cooking, oh, actually. Really? Instant espresso I get. Instant espresso, very it can. I recommend it. I have sometimes given it to people pretending it's proper coffee. <laughs> and um, I am a complete tea addict. And so I can't write or do anything without lots and lots of tea. Do you so find that important. around the house are discarded cups of the half cold? No, or are you good at finishing I'm, the full I'm cup? I'm good at finishing. What I do have, though, is that because it's so boring to open a bin to put all the tea bags in, I have a, like, a mini tagine mm-hmm. um, with a cover. So I put my tea bags inside there. And then you can cover it up. And, and then I have lots. Not there. Yeah. And then I have so many, I can't believe how many I've got. Sometimes I keep the bag in if I'm too impatient to wait to, you know, to take it out. I keep it in, so I'm slapped around the cheek. I use this canister a lot, all of them, in filming. So one day there's lentils, one day something else, because they're pretty and they, they're shiny, but they don't have too much reflection. And is it a ritual that in order to sit down to write, you first of all have to make yourself a hot cup of tea? Like, is it, yes, can and it not I begin? also use it making tea as a way of having a bit of a pace and a think. I don't have email, I don't have my phone on. And I do need to walk up and down and sometimes I need to work out a thought while moving. And so making tea is a very important part of it. Are you quite a tea connoisseur? I have just, you know, property, as in property is theft. Because you can get even and things... that's that, it. You can get all these things now, special kettles that don't I quite know. boil, Germans but just have that. come so and got, I did have a German kettle which had different numbers. But now, can I just tell you that my grandfather was a tea merchant and he would be so disgusted with what I'm about to tell you. Okay. I've got, I've got a boiling water tap. 
Really? Because for him, it, tea had to be absolutely boiling. Well, that's why they say you can't get a good cup of tea in the in the states you because can't. they don't have kettles. Yeah, but they even have even Pro- their water. Their water's not hot. Mm. At first, when I went onto my boiling water tap, I did feel it was taking some of the ritual of waiting away. Mm. But now I've got used to it. <laughs> well, there you are. Yeah, now I've got used to it. I have a kettle for backup mm-hmm. should anything happen. And when I travel, I have my rider. My rider for work, I have to have a kettle in my room Mm -hmm. so I can make tea. The idea of having to phone room service to get a cup of tea would make me so stressed. So I come with tea bags and everything. Yeah, you're right. In American hotels, there's no kettle. No, I just realised. I need to have a kettle (laughs) and I I travel with my tea bags. My (laughs) my typhoo in, you know, crinkly cases in my suitcase. My grandmother used to carry her own tea bags because we, my parents preferred Earl Grey, but she liked uh, PG tips and she'd have a handbag full. And she also used to have cup of soups in her bag. Always. Very wise. Can't go wrong with a cup of soup. I have to limit what I do take but I do take quite a bit but the tea bags definite I have to have and um, I take little things of Malden salt mm-hmm. and I take Commons mustard yes and you've spoken about that before now, English mustard is very important especially because sometimes you're given food that is really so inedible on the road that the only way through it is <laughs> English mustard yes. Um, talking about modernising and your boiling water tap and so on, you yes. do talk about recipes in, in How to Eat that you have brought up to date or at least maybe taken mm. some of the extra jobs out. One is ratatouille, for example, of that you don't have to salt and drain the aubergines and all that. Was that important to you as well, that the, the sense that there was lots of tasks and chores and drudgery involved in some recipes? But I think it's part of being honest that I can't write a recipe that says salt the aubergines and leave them to us if I never do that. And I do, and I do think that we get aubergines in better quality than they did in the olden days when they probably did come all sort of bitter and horrible. There are certain things that I do think are worth it in certain recipes. Sometimes I will peel a tomato just by pouring boiling water over it and then it's very easy. And so I think a lot of times when I do other people's recipes and I can be very inspired by a particular dish, but I will always think, but why is it? there are far too many steps? You don't need it to be like that. And I think that's the way I cook. I do try and simplify it, but I just think as long as the flavour's good, the rest does, the rest is there in service to the flavour. And I think, I mean, it's it's absolutely the case that, and you are successful in that. And I mean, I was only saying to my husband a month ago. I'm not just saying this because we do, I didn't know mm. we were going to be talking a month ago. I literally said to him, "It's okay. I'm going to cook a new thing from Nigella." But I don't have to worry. I can. The good thing about Nigella is you can follow the recipe exactly, and it will work. And that's well, I the test thing. and test a lot. You see, because I think that I know sometimes people just test once. But you see, everything is a bit different each time you do it. And unless I've cooked something a lot, I can't. I don't really feel I'm able to give a full account of how things might play out. And every time you cook something, you can think of a way to simplify it. I test and test because I'm obsessive, but I suppose it also does put off the point of writing. Yes. <laughs> Do you find yourself doing that? Are you a procrastinator with writing? Well, I am up to a point. I mean, I am, but I'm, because I was a journalist for a long time before, I'm someone who really needs a deadline and then I'll do it. I think most people who write have that feeling, which is that to get myself to sit down on that chair and write as hard, but when I'm there and writing, I feel most myself. Yeah, absolutely. Let's move on to your final object Mm. now, uh, which is a copy of More Home Cooking by Laurie Colvin. Uh, So why did you bring this along? What does this mean Well, I was going to bring home cooking, but I couldn't find it. Okay. Um, But then I was very glad. Uh, I think Laurie Colvin is a wonderful writer. She was uh, a novelist and short story writer. Home Cooking subtitle was A Novelist in the Kitchen. She really writes short stories in a sense around food or around something she's interested in so in many ways it's without realizing it a lot of her recipes are written a bit like the recipes on how to eat I mean in a different way but just simply because she mentions what you could do there's a rather wonderful I'm just making noises as I turn the pages but I think that's allowed and it's in, a, nice. in the penguin podcast it's authentic it is and also so there's a um essay at the beginning which I hadn't read for ages and I read it again as I was going through my books choosing which to bring here called you know why I love cookbooks she talks about even when she was a child she was always fascinated with what people ate and she felt that when she read novels she was so fascinated about the you know the dining scenes and then when she realized you came across some books which just gave you the food that was so wonderful and about how food tells you everything about how someone lives and actually it's quite interesting I read an interview with Anne Tyler and 
she said that she will bring food in to some of her novels because it's such a shortcut to selling you something about a particular character. But I love uh, Laurie Coleman's writing. I think that she makes you think about food, but she thinks about the way one lives a life and how food and the rest of life fit in with one another, actually. Uh, and uh, they're charming, but they're, but there's something more profound about them as well. And actually, you yourself reveal certain things about the way you think and the way you live mm. in How to Eat, such as the the funny um, anecdote about buying a load of um, oranges to make marmalade and then just letting them go mouldy. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, it's very funny and it, it's, it is also revealing, but obviously you, you have control mm. over what you reveal because you're yes. writing about yourself, uh, which uh, Tracy Thorne actually talked about recently mm. when she was writing her memoir. Wonderful um, memoir. Yeah, brilliant. You want to tell people it's all right that if they have also bought a box of something and yes. just let it go off in a cupboard, you know, I don't, you're not no, a terrible I do, person. No, but I still feel guilty about it. <laughs> I, ha I am obsessive about not wasting food, so you know I should have just given them away to people, and that's a bad thing. But it, that's I think what that's about is having unattainable goals. Not that making marmalade is, and in, sometimes I have made marmalade. But actually, if you think you're going to become someone you're not and suddenly be the sort of person who, you know, lines drawers and, you know, sterilises jars and writes labels, I'm not really that kind of a person. And so I have to do cooking in a way that suits me. I'll make, make a really small batch of, of marmalade because I don't want a big pot. Mm -hmm. So I think it is about that. It's about finding out what is manageable. And I have to tell everyone to, to just, when you buy this book or reread it or read it for the first time, just there is a treat on the last page about how to prepare the ideal Marmite sandwich, <laughs> which I cannot wait to try myself because I love a Marmite sandwich and oh, it's never important. occurred to me to do it like this. I don't want to give it away. You'll have to no, go no, and look very, for yourself. Very important. It is very important. Day of my life. But I love that you're, you say parents for your kids' parties phone up and ask to make yeah. sure that those sandwiches <laughs> are going to be on the table. <laughs> Let's move on to a clip now because we are talking about the audio book, uh, the audio version of How to Eat, which you yourself have read. And we've got a great clip here one of the tenets of how to eat is the basics and one of those basics is roast chicken I think something that is very much associated with you as well and so there's a section of the book here where you describe your mother's talents particularly in coaxing some beautiful flavors out of what you call an inferior bird sometimes right. so let's have a listen to that now my mother could make the stringiest toughest flesh a bird that had been intensively farmed and frozen since the last ice age taste as if it were a lovingly reared poulet de bresse. She, you see, was a product of her age, which believed that cooking lay in what you did to inferior products, and I expect she did no more in this case than use much more butter than anyone would now. I, however, am a product of mine, which believes that you always use the best, the freshest produce of the highest quality you can afford, and then do as little as possible to it. So I buy organic free-range chickens and anoint them with the tiniest amount of extra virgin olive oil or butter, as if I were putting on very expensive hand cream before putting them in the oven. I retain the lemon out of habit and to make my kitchen smell like my mother's with its aromatic, oily, sharp fug. I can't honestly say that my roast chicken tastes better than hers, but I don't like eating intensively farmed, battery-reared meat. However, if you know you've got an inferior bird in front of you, cook it for the first hour breast side down. This means you don't, at the end, have quite that glorious effect of the swelling burnished breast. The chicken will have more of a flapper's bosom, flat but fleshy. But the white meat will be more tender because all the fats and juices will have oozed their way into it. And that was How to Eat, written and read by my guest Nigella Lawson. And that very funny line in there, it looks like a flapper's breast <laughs> but I mean it you know which it did and that that's obviously what occurred to me as I was cooking it mm -hmm. you know these are images that just that happen of their own accord are there good memories of of cooking and eating as a child I mean your mother's obviously a very um, powerful influence in some no respects. I hated eating as a child oh did you actually well I hated meals that's different mm -hmm. I hated meals um, but I did like food in some respects I eat a lot spinach was a I loved spinach as a child. And did you hate meals because they were very formal? It was more that my mother would stress a lot. Mm, right. But also that I was brought up in a way that was old-fashioned even for the time. So that if you didn't 
finish something, you would be made to sit at the table till you finished it. And then if you really didn't do it, then it would be your plate would be brought back cold at the next meal. So food became a great power struggle. Mm-hmm. But it taught me something about, you know, don't force people to eat. And I understand my parents had been children in the war. You know, it's so waste would have seemed terrible. And in fact, when my children were small, I did say, you know, try it, but you don't have to finish it. I'm bad about waste. I, I, it makes me feel anxious. I avoid it in my own life a lot. But nevertheless, you can't f- force someone to eat something in order n- not to have half a plate of stew to throw away. So it is a difficult one. Well, I think that's something you do so well. You understand so well mm. at just an absolutely deep, deep level that that food is not just about preparing food and then putting it in your mouth and then mm. digesting it. There is emotion and psychology mm. to food that everybody will have in their own specific way, whatever it is. Yeah. And that in order to eat better and take better care of ourselves, we have to forgive ourselves a little bit or, yeah. or at least acknowledge or understand ourselves. We understand ourselves through food, mm. which is a really fascinating way to look at it. Yes, I think you're right. I think in a way that's what made How to Eat so relevant revolutionary you said you thought it might be the only cookery book mm. you would write um, and then I went on I, yes. I liked it a lot I don't know I liked it um, maybe it's self-indulgent but I but I enjoy it mm. well everyone else does so it can't be self-indulgent <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what's next for you what are you doing I've got a few things on um, the back burner and I never know quite which one will become a project I have a few that could become and so I'm cooking and I'm writing a bit And sometimes, you know, I've thought I was writing one book, but another book has taken its place. So until I've cooked quite a lot, I can't tell what's the right project. I also love your just continuing genuine pleasure in food and eating. And I loved all your pictures recently of your trip to Australia and all the food. It it seems like sometimes you'll go on a real genuine holiday or Mm. or a break somewhere in the world and come back and suddenly feel inspired. Very. And I think, you know, sometimes being inspired doesn't mean you're going to cook the authentic recipes of that region but you get interested in particular ingredients or an attitude it just makes you look at your own country in a different way Mm. well I think that's what people respond to it's real you know the love of food is real it's authentic it's genuinely part of your life it's not a construct or a commercial endeavor it's absolutely couldn't be that yes (laughs) well you couldn't have achieved what you have achieved uh, if it was and thank you so much for talking to me today about your absolutely seminal book how to eat uh, and everything else to do with food and life it's been wonderful thank you Nigella Lawson thank you Katie And just a reminder that if you haven't already, do subscribe to the Penguin podcast using websites such as Acast, iTunes, SoundCloud, Audioboom and Spotify or on an app on your smartphone. We're also available on your Alexa enabled device. And if you like what you hear, please do share, rate and review the Penguin podcast because we'd love to know what you think. She Lies in Wait is the chilling debut novel from Geetha Lodge, about six friends and a tagalong who is destined to be found years later, seemingly killed by one of the friends. But who is the murderer among them? Jonah was halfway up Blissford Hill when he felt the buzz of his phone in the zip pocket on the back of his lycra. He was standing up on the pedals and slogging upwards. He considered ignoring it, and then had a vivid image of his mum in hospital. And following that, he had a slightly stomach-turning thought that it might be Michelle, which was just as irrational as every other time he'd believed it in the last eight months. But he thought it anyway. The audiobook edition She Lies in Wait is available in CD and download now.